Let's move over now to the second uh, presentation in this session. And I would like to introduce uh, Francois Venter. So Francois Venter is the head of Isincha at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Francois has been uh, leading multiple antiviral, antiretroviral trials and optimization studies. Uh, he's working on new first and second line options for treatment. And uh, Francois has also been an advisor to government bodies, but also UNAIDS and WHO, and has, has really helped inform some of the guidelines that we have. And finally, Francois is an avid and keen mentor and supervisor of many master and PhD students. So, Francois, over to you for your presentation, Dolly Tegrever and Weight Gain. Where are we now? Thank you, Francois. Hi, everybody. I'm Francois Fenta. I'm here to give you an update on the whole Dolly Tegrever and Weight Gain saga. I have way too many slides as usual. But just to thank Andy Hill and my entire funky team who did this, as well as people like Gary Martins and Andrew Carr, who've really been reflecting on this very, very complex um, association between integrase inhibitors and weight gain. These are all my disclosures. It's really important. The most important ones at the end is I'm borderline overweight, so I have a vested interest in all of this. I think the big deal here is how did we ever get here? How did we get to stay? where those of us who grew up in the AIDS era um, were looking after walking skeletons and now we're talking about people who are, are overweight. And it's important to remember that the Across the world, people are gaining weight. The average BMI is going up. And these are just some famous South African politicians just to demonstrate that weight gain within my community is something that is an issue. But what I'm going to try and talk to you about is two things. Is, is the weight gain a thing? Is this a side effect of the drugs? And secondly, like, is it a bad thing? You know, and a lot challenging just some of the dogma that we've had around this. Now, all our patients are starting to live forever. If you start something on antiretrovirals and they take the therapy, they don't get side effects, they're actually starting to live longer than the general population if you start them at a decent CD4 count. And with that means they're getting all sorts of things like weight gain. The first um, reports of weight gain were around 2017 when one patient who switched from efavirenz to dolitegra went back to efavirenz because they were complaining about their weight gain. But since then, we've had multiple reports. Um, they've mainly been with the neurointegrase inhibitors, uh, not with cabotegra, but certainly with bictegra and dolitegra, the one we're rolling out, and with relitegra and elvitegra, although to a lesser degree than the, than the new generation ones. We've also seen it with the, the tenofovir analog, tenofovir alafenamide, and we've even seen it with rural privering, which is often said to be the drug that people like going to. Um, it was not registered in the registration studies. Um, and it was not reported until quite late on um, from either one of the dolitegra and bictegra registration studies. Um, and we have to see this in the context where we're rolling out dolitegra and perhaps even TAF to millions, tens of millions of people across Africa. So this is, if it is a side effect of these classes of drugs, it's a fairly major one. Andy Hill and his group of troublemakers raised this in um, early 2019. Um, and Andy noted the fact that actually that consistently tenofovir seems to be associated with not gaining weight. So it's not clear. And in fact, in some studies, even with weight loss, even when in both prevention and in treatment studies, even when um, we corrected for the backbone. Um, and this has led to hypotheses that tenofovir actually mitigates weight gain, that drugs like abacavir which are, and TAF, which are also very well tolerated, actually just returns back to your normal trajectory of weight gain. I'll get back to that in a moment. This little German study also caused the cat amongst the pigeons, put the cat amongst the pigeons. When people move from tenofovir to TAF, they started to gain weight. And Andy then went and dug back and demonstrated actually that there were a significant number of patients in the tenofovir versus PrEP study, uh, versus placebo PrEP studies that demonstrated a lot of them actually lost weight, which is then credence to this idea that maybe it's enough of you that's, that's blunting the weight gain that we're seeing anyway. But then the integrase inhibitors came along and be rapidly became standard of care across Europe, the States, all the richer countries, and then moved into Africa and Asia and the rest of us. Um, in a, a theme discussion earlier this year, Croy, they, um, they brought up the weight gain issue and demonstrated that women seem to gain more weight and that black people seem to gain more weight, which you can imagine me as a person working in Southern Africa watching in frank horror at these data being presented because it was like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to us? Um, Andy seemed to indicate that dolitegra and bictegra seem to give you 
equal amounts of weight gain and the various studies where they've gone head to head or where the backbone has been the same. And I think none of us were surprised at this as the drugs are very, very similar in terms of their chemical composition. Um, Paul Sachs put together this amalgamation of all the Gilead registration da data. And again, um, published this in CID towards the end of last year and demonstrated again that race and sex were a major issue as well as having more advanced disease, which is kind of intuitive as you probably have lost more weight. So you've got more weight to gain. Um, it also demonstrated the same drugs were involved, including rolperine and interestingly enough, um, atazanavir. Um, and again, this race gender divide. Um, and that showed it was particularly bad with the integrase inhibitors and particularly bad with TAF. Um, in a study published at the I will shown at the IIS a little while um, just a few months ago again this move across the integrase inhibitors this move across to TAF was associated with with weight gain and Andy's put together this very nice little summary which seems to indicate what's associated and it's very important associated not caused um, we're not certain which of these drugs are causing weight gain and which ones of them are maybe causing weight loss or mitigating weight gain and I'm going to come back to that in a moment and why did we not see this in the registration studies? Well, again, Andy's um, uh, smart young things went in and gathered the data. And it's because they were tested largely in white middle-class gay men, um, when actually the most, the vast majority of people taking the drugs are actually black women. Even in places like America and, and Europe, these studies of new antiretrovirals actually weren't particularly representative of the population within those countries where they were taken from. And this is a really interesting, freely available article that, that's available to you to go and look. So coming back to my study, which was published for the first time last year, and it's an update in Lancet HIV just a few weeks ago, looked at this. Um, we did not anticipate weight gain wasn't the side effect when we designed the study. So it wasn't me being and my colleagues being smart. We were just lucky. Um, but we looked at the old standard of care, the favorin based regimen down there at the bottom, the current regimen, which has been rolled out across Africa in the middle, and the new dream TAF based regimen at the top. And this study, which um, recruited black women, um, um, in fact, when we presented to the FDA, they noted that there were more black women in our study than all the, represent than all the registration studies combined for the integrase inhibitors. Um, it was mainly, as you can see, very representative of the population that is receiving antiretrovirals in sub-Saharan Africa. What was interesting, though, and something I only realized as I was presenting, is that the women weighed more than the men at entry into the um, into the. Uh, into the advance. And that's important because um, it does demonstrate a background um, of weight gain in this community as people have got richer and have access to caloric rich food. Um, and again, you can see a remarkable big difference between the BMIs between the men and the women and the significant number of people who are overweight or obese. The study itself in terms of efficacy of the drugs, nobody was surprised. It was very boring. They all did well. Dolitegra just brought the viral load down quicker, but they all persisted out with a slight statistically non-significant difference out to 96 weeks and beyond. Now we have that data. But this was the slide that caused the problem that showed a dramatic increase in weight gain, particularly amongst women um, in the TAF arm. But even in the Dolitech arm, what's important though is even in the Favrin's arm, we saw weight gain being done. And we saw a similar thing amongst men, um, much more blunted. Um, and with the men, there seems to be a trajectory, like it's kind of flattening off um, over time with the eye of faith. And this data, which is incomplete out to 100 144 weeks, so we're running to 192 weeks. And with it, as you'd expect, treatment emergent obesity in terms of BMI levels. Um, what was interesting is we did DEXA scanning. We, I'd love to tell you we were smart, but as I said, we didn't know the weight gain was happening. But with DEXA, you can actually look at where the fat's gone. And it seems to be equally distributed across the body into the, into the gut, which is not a good idea. Intra-abdominal fat is associated with bad things, but across the body. So people, as opposed to thymidine analogs like D4T and AZT, where they got lipoatrophy, these patients looked almost normal. So they gained fat, but there was not something about them that the, the body composition of the fat made them sit up and say, no, that's weird. And as you can tell that if you start extrapolating the straight line amongst women, you start getting these scary, scary projections of weight gain. As I said, it's important to look at that bottom line, which is their Farron's arm, showing significant weight gain even amongst their Farron's patients. NAMSAL, which was done in Cameroon, compared low-dose deferrins with dolitegravir, and again, demonstrate very similar weight gain um, in their cohort over 48 weeks and also published in the Lancet of 96 week data. So very reassuring for me as somebody working on advance that somebody else found very similar data amongst black people. Um, and with, as you'd expect, we demonstrated that we have 
increased risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease going forward, which is a big deal in a place like South, South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia, where we have where diabetes is a major killer after tuberculosis. Um, so when we're giving people diabetes with, as a side effect, that's not a good thing. Similarly, in the DAD study, which is recruiting of uh, many richer countries, they demonstrated the increased risk of diabetes, but not of cardiovascular disease, or not yet at any rate. So again, complicated data. Everybody here was involved in neural tube defect and all the drama around neural tube defects, which has settled somewhere between one and two extra neural tube defects per thousand women treated in the first trimester. But Andy went and looked at what the weight gain would do to pregnancy. And while it didn't have an impact on neural tube defect, it had a massive impact on a whole range of other bad things. Uh, so as weight is gained on the tenofovir arm and in the dolotegra arm, there's a small number of increased adverse outcomes in terms of both for the fetus and for, for mom. And this is really important important data because it suggests that the neural tube defect actually was you know, clouded into the background in terms of consequences of um, on this. So it's really important for us to start grappling with what does this weight gain mean? And that's important with what I'm going to discuss in just a moment. One of the things um, Gary Martins, of, who honestly, between him and Andy Carr, are the two people who like hold my feet to the fire when it comes to like keeping an eye on what is causation, what is association. And Gary, in this really interesting little study, demonstrated that it was the patients with very high Favrin's levels that actually didn't gain weight, that when your Favrin's levels were normal, that you were a normal metabolizer of your Favrin's, you actually had the same weight gain as dolutegavir when you had it combined with tenofovir, suggesting, in fact, that if Favrin's is the, is the drug that's blunting in a subset of patients the weight gain. So this is very different from the na initial narrative, which is TAF and dolutegavir causing you to gain weight and suggest if Aaron's is blunting that. So, so many questions like, is this multiple antiretrovirals that have off-target toxicities that are causing the same toxicity, which is weight gain? Andrew Carr says he finds it's really difficult to believe and increasingly I'm persuaded the same way. Or is it simply a tolerance issue? These are just wonderful drugs with no side effects and the old agents like tenofovir and efavirenz are the problem. If it's the former, um, we going to maybe see... Um, in non-inferiority studies differences. But if it's the latter, we may be in a terrible position where this weight gain is something we just have to deal with and it's got nothing to do with the ARVs. So it's very important that we be asking for this data um, in black women. Now I'm going to pivot somewhere though and just say we need to ask some really harsh questions about the obesity and the BMI and this kind of obesity panic that we're part of and the medical establishment is part of. Um, I've been teaching off this Lancet paper which came from a couple of years ago, which is um, looking at weight gain across different continents and demonstrated that there was poor outcomes associated with weight gain. Um, it seemed to be less so in Africa, less so in Asia, much more so in Europe and America. But this study has been heavily criticized by some really senior epidemiologists, which suggests that this was actually an inappropriate analysis. Now, I've been using this study to teach of for years now. Um, it's also important to understand that weight is very culturally sensitive. Like what Johannesburg thinks is sexy is very different from what Delhi thinks is sexy is probably very similar, very different from Adelaide. So we also have a lot of stigma associated with being skinny. People often, certainly in my community, have seen this as associated with TB and HR and cancer. Um, and as we all know, the advertising industry like revels in making us feel terrible about our bodies. Um, we also know that people's ideas of what is skinny and what isn't is actually deeply flawed. And studies have shown, particularly in Southern Africa, that people think what is normal weight actually is often associated with BMIs, which are quite high. This study, which I suggest you go and look at, came out a few weeks ago, um, completely through the cat amongst the pigeon. In fact, demonstrated in a very large cohort of more, looking at mortality data, population-based cohort. In fact, people who had BMIs that would be considered morbidly obese actually had the lowest death rate. And this shows a deep philosophical debate about what is a normal weight. Is it one where you're the most lowest place where you're going to die, which means that people with abnormal BMIs are actually the normal BMIs. And what do you do? And if you looked at this, you actually would start proposing McDonald's feeding schemes in populations for skinny people because it's so stark, the, the benefits of having a high BMI. 
And the thing about this is this is not new data. The CDC, there's this amazing um, researcher called Catherine Flegel has been saying this for years, is that these BMI bins that we use for normal are actually underweight or associated with poor outcomes. And we have to understand who we're colluding with, that we're colluding with some really horrible people who make a lot of money out of you feeling crap about your body. And I think we need to think as the medical profession about this before we start running, rushing out with our obesity things. We also have to understand we, other than processed carbohydrates, we have very little to offer in terms of the healthy diets. These are all just plucked diets from various, they all show that you lose a bit of weight and then you usually get it back within a year or two and actually overshoot in most cases. So the medical profession doesn't have much to, to offer. So we have all these things we know are bad about being obese, associated with diabetes, hypertension, lipids, but you have to ask yourself, so these things all happen to you, they're all bad things, yet you die less according to that Kwasi Natal obesity study I was showing you less. So what is this all about? What is this complication around this? We also know being skinny is associated, you saw that with that obesity study from KZM, but this again from a couple of years ago from Nature demonstrated that actually being underweight and having a BMI that's normal is actually much worse than being morbidly obese in terms of mortality. And I love this quote from um, Kristen Dunkel saying, if we didn't know any of this, fat was bad for you, would you look at this data like that and what you, would you make of it? And I think there is a real Calvinist um, aspect to our interventions around, um, around obesity. So in conclusion, we know that the weight gain is real. It's associated with dolotegravir, bactegravir, and even and with TAF, and also with drugs like rilpivirine. It doesn't mean it's caused by them. It might be that their tolerability is so good that we just enter into a normal trajectory of weight gain. Dolotegravir may not be as, if, as perfect as we had hoped, but unfortunately at the moment, the only alternative we have as a switch option is the efavirenz. And we don't know if switching back to efavirenz will affect this weight trajectory. We don't know if switching to doravirine, although that drug is looking quite hopeful, will affect the weight gain. Um, I think it's unlikely that TAF is going to be recommended in Africa until, unless we have a major breakthrough because at this stage, you know, if it is associated with this much weight gain, um, that's a secondary public health headache that we really don't need. And for people like me and people like you, this is actually a major, major headache is we're swapping one epidemic, HIV, for another epidemic, obesity, and we're not clear on what's doing what in the midst of all this. So we need new options. We need our own local populations to be um, looked at. And um, for all of us, this is something we really need to get our head around, a complex public health challenge that I hope we're all up to. Thank you very much.